Well, I've got a confession to make to you. People have asked me many times whether or not I've done something. And I want to say yes to it. I want to say that I'm good at it. And especially when it comes time for me to get asked these questions, I surely want to say, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm really good at that. But I'm never really able to honestly say that I'm good at it. So whenever I go to the dentist and they ask me if I floss, are you like that? Did you guys read that study that said flossing might give you heart disease? Did you see that? Because, like, if you floss, then, like, some of the bacteria will get in your blood, and then that actually causes heart disease. Yeah. Like, one doctor said that. And then all the rest said, you should probably floss. And every time I go to the dentist and they say, hey, do you floss? I'm like, yeah, well, kind of. I mean, like, I, I did this week because I thought about this conversation we were about to have. And I probably will next week because I remember this conversation. But in between, like, I just, I don't like the floss, like the big, long thing of floss. I've never been good with that. And, you know, the floss picks, you just kind of feel like you're four years old with the, with the floss picks. And if you get one of those little specialty brushes, it's like, that's just, uh, I don't know. I, I could do that, but I don't want to do that. I don't have any of those. And then if I use a water pick, it's like, dude, I don't have braces. I don't need a water pick. Do you ever make you wear, uh, uh, when you're wearing braces, you have to use the water pick? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I think it's terrible. Bad memory. So point is, every time I'm asked, do you floss? I'm kind of like, eh, not really. Uh, because really, it's a private thing except for when I'm asked. And uh, it's one of those things that is so private, if it goes undone, it's not like people will notice. It's not even like brushing your teeth, right? Of course I brush my teeth. I brush my teeth twice a day. Uh, Some people brush it three times a day. I can understand why you do that. But I brush it twice a day and that's fine because I feel like that's sufficient. Uh, But that's less private. But the more private something gets, a lot of times it goes neglected and we don't often do what's so private because nobody's in our life asking us about it. Uh, That's what flossing is like for most of the year, except for the time right before and right after going to the dentist. Well, there's something else that we're going to talk about this weekend that kind of feels like a private thing. And because it feels private, and because people don't often ask us about it, it so often goes neglected. We sometimes don't even do this thing. You guys know this weekend we're talking about prayer. Hopefully you know that. It's on your bulletins. It's on our shirts that we got. The phrase, ask, seek, knock. And those words come from Jesus directly when he invites his people to pray. And he invites everyone to pray, really. But as a church, or as people who call themselves Christians, we of all people need to be people who are praying. And obviously, I'm not telling you something you don't know. But tonight might feel like the question that's asked at the dentist, do you floss? Because if most of you answer these questions honestly tonight, you're probably going to come to the conclusion that we don't pray as often or as well or as much as we should, or at least with all of our heart as we should. Most people would say, hey, how's your prayer life going? If you answered honestly, 9 out of 10 people, maybe 99 people out of 100 would say, Yeah, I wish it was better, but it's not as good as it needs to be. That's what we're going to talk about this weekend. So please grab a Bible and look at Matthew chapter 7. Let's look at the words that Jesus gave to us. Ask, seek, knock. Those are invitations to prayer. Let's look at Matthew chapter 7. Now, this is in the middle of a big, long sermon. He's actually kind of wrapping up this sermon where he's told a lot of different things about obeying God, about what it looks like to really live a Christian life that pleases God. He's talked about all that. He's exposed people who think that they're righteous, And think that they've kept God's law and he shows them, no, you haven't kept God's law as well as you need to. He says, you actually have to be perfect to enter the kingdom of God. That's what he's just preached about. And after that, he exposes there's a way to be saved and that's through him. And what he talks about here in Matthew chapter 7, hopefully you've turned there at this point. Matthew chapter 7, he he invites them to pray. Look what he says in verse 7. He says, ask and it will be given to you. That right there is one of the biggest promises in all of the Bible. Jesus, who is, like we sang about, Lord of heaven and earth. Colossians 1 says he created you. We quoted Romans 11, 36. All things are from him and to him and through him. And he says, ask me, ask, and it will be given. Now, we could stop right there and we could ask the question, how often do you ask for things from Jesus? How often do you ask? What do you ask for? Like that's such a big promise that sits right there, but most of us let that promise go completely unclaimed because we never think about it. Ask and it will be given. Look at the next thing. He goes further. Seek and you will find. I could ask what room you're in. I could ask, you know, what you had for breakfast, but it's one thing for me to ask. It's another thing for me to go after you, find you, and seek you out. Seeking is even further. Seek and you will find. Third one, even more. Knock 
and it will be open to you. Not only could I say, hey, what room are you in? That's asking. Seeking would be trying to follow you and try to find you somewhere. Knocking is me getting to the door and knocking on the door. All three of those kind of go more intense as they go along. What's Jesus trying to say? He's saying you need to ask God for things. He doesn't define yet what they are, but he's saying you need to ask. And you can be done asking, and then you got to go seek. And then you got to knock. It's intensity. The point is, how many of us pray, even like this one verse tells us to? Ask, seek, knock. Look what he says next. Verse number eight. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, it will be open. To, to them it will be open. What Jesus is saying is, you need to ask God for things, because verse eight says, God will answer prayers. Um, we can stop right there. And most people in this room, believe it or not, do not actually believe that that's true. Because if you actually believe that was true, your prayer life would look different. If what you thought was, yes, God is ready, willing, and excited to answer my prayers. If you thought that, and you trusted wholeheartedly that when you pray, that God would answer, your prayer life would probably look radically different than it does right now. Do you believe that God will answer prayers? Look at verse 9. He gives an illustration. He says, which one of you, if he has a son who asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Right? Eden's up here this weekend. Jordan's up here this weekend. Eden's cute. I'm bad because, you know, I want to give her more than what I should give her. If she asks for more food or more water or candy or to, when we were driving up today, she was reaching for the chocolate bar that we were eating and she kind of had it. I'm like, you know what? She can have it for a little while. And I'm thinking that's probably not smart to give a kid a big, you know, dark chocolate candy bar. Probably not a good idea for a 14-month-old. But I'm like, I just want her to have it, right? But if I want to give her something good, does it say, look, a father is going to give a kid a good thing. It says there, if someone asks for a fish, we'll give him a serpent. Then he turns it on them in verse 11. Look what it says in your Bibles. It says, if you then, who are evil. Huh, that's kind of a slam. He's saying, hey, you guys are evil, but even evil people know how to give good gifts to their children. How much more will your father, talking about the Lord, who is in heaven, he's not on earth. He has more resources than any father does here. He's more loving and caring than any father is here. How much more will he give good things to those who ask him? The qualifications there, of course, are that God is actually your father. And the reality is God is not everyone's father. In fact, I want to make a big, bold claim to you. And it's going to be our first point tonight. It's a huge claim. It's this. If you never pray... If you never pray, you are not a Christian. You're not. I know that might sound, is that legalistic? No. If you never pray, you are not saved. You're not forgiven. You're not repentant. Because if you've never gone to God and communicated with God, you are not saved. You are what's called dead in your sins, as Ephesians 2 says. You might be thinking, is that so? Yeah, that is really the case. I want you to turn to another passage. You're in Matthew chapter 7. Turn to the right in your Bibles. Turn to Luke chapter 18. Luke 18. Two people are going to be praying in this text, but it's just interesting, the thought. And I do want you to think about it as you're turning there. Wow, is it possible to be saved without praying? The answer is it's impossible. It's impossible. Why? Well, because how do you get saved? How do you become a Christian? Like, Think about it. Those of you who are saved, what were you doing when God saved you? You were praying. That's what happened. It didn't mean you were, you know, bowing down. It didn't mean your eyes were closed. It didn't mean you were on your knees or anything like that. But the point is, when you were saved, if you're a Christian, you were praying. That's how it happened. That's how it worked. Think that through. That's an amazing thing. You can't become a Christian without talking to God. Right? And, and you might say, okay, but I do talk to God. Well, many people think that they talk to God because they have ideas in their mind and they say things like, okay, I'm going to pray. And when someone bows their head, like, you know, Joseph and the worship team just prayed, um, we think we're praying just by adopting the posture of prayer. That's not all that praying is. Praying simply, if we're going to get a super simple definition, is you communicating with God, right? And how do you communicate with God? Does God need you to speak words out of your mouth? He doesn't need to speak. He doesn't need you to speak words out of your mouth. What he needs is you in your heart to think your thoughts and then direct them to God. It's that simple. Right? And often we speak those things out loud because, you know, when we think, we, we talk, right? Think about how many words we say every day. It's thousands and thousands of words. Right? God says, I need you to communicate with me. That's how this all works. You turn to Luke chapter 18. Look at verse 9. It says, Jesus told these people a parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they treated others with contempt. 
What this means is some people in that crowd thought they were too good for other people. They were too good to hang with other people. They thought they were better than other people. And he says, Jesus told a parable to correct them. Verse number 10. He says, two men went up to the temple to pray. One, a Pharisee. And the other, a tax collector. These are the two extremes back then. The Pharisee is the, the person who, you know, is a pastor or a seminary graduate or a person who writes books for a living about God and who's a speaker and who goes all around and teaches people about God. That's the Pharisee. The tax collector is kind of the scum of the earth guy who betrayed his country, who was constantly in this attitude of going against his people, of stealing money. That's actually how tax collectors got rich. It wasn't by actually just collecting the taxes because they would collect taxes, give it to Rome. But what they would do is if you owed $100, let's just say, I know it wasn't dollars, but if you owed $100, they'd say, yeah, you owe $500 in taxes. And they would keep $400. That's how they would make their money. And they would give $100 to the government. They were professional thieves. So you couldn't get two more extreme types of people. Verse 11 says, the Pharisee, and I don't even want you to read the word Pharisee. Think of pastor. Think of godly person. Think of an old, mature, you might even think of a Christian. Think that through. That's who this person was to these people. He says, the Pharisee standed, was standing by himself and he prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men. Extortioners, that means stealing money from people. Unjust or adulterers, right? People who commit uh, sexual immorality. Thank you that you didn't make me like one of them. Says, or even like this tax collector. So this guy, he's literally in church, right? He's praying. He looks over. He sees someone in the corner of the room who's actually seeking God. And he says, oh, God, I'm so glad I'm not as dumb as them. I'm so glad I'm not as sinful as them. He says, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get, right? You don't even do that. Do you fast twice a week? Do you skip two meals twice a week so that you can pray to God? I bet you don't even do that. But this guy does it. Do you give tithes of all you get? Do you give 10% of every last gift? I bet you don't even do that, right? This Pharisee's righteous. He does a lot of good things. And that's the point. Jesus is trying to show this guy does a lot that's good. He's righteous on the outside. But the reality is he does not know God. Look at verse 13. The tax collector in the corner of the room, was standing far off, and he would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. But he beat his breast. That means he was hitting himself in the chest. And he said this, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Super simple prayer. Not much to that prayer, right? Very simple. But with that prayer, with him going to God, and not just with saying the words, but with him meaning that, verse 14 says, Jesus said this, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. The word justified, if you know your New Testament, that's one of the most important theological words that Paul uses all the time to talk about people who are saved. The word justification. That means that God would put his stamp of approval on somebody, declared right. One person walked home that day justified, and it was not the Pharisee. It wasn't the person who looked righteous. It wasn't even the person who did righteous things before that. It was the one who prayed humbly to God. This man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. The one who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. You lift yourself up, you think you don't need God. Even some of you who think that you have God, and you think that I don't need to pray, and there's, I don't need to you know, tell God, we're good. He understands. I understand. He looks at my life. I, I know I'm not perfect, but like he gets it. I get it. I don't know how to talk to him about it. That's what the Pharisee was doing. The tax collector got saved that day. The first point, if you never pray, I want you to write this down. This is, might be bold, but you cannot be forgiven by God. If you never pray, you cannot be forgiven by God. In other words, if you're a person in the room who's never actually taken your thoughts and directed them to God, this is a scary reality, but, but follow me on this. Uh, it's impossible, biblically, for you to be a Christian tonight if you've never prayed. God calls people to pray. He calls unrighteous people to pray. And this is interesting. Um, some people tonight don't pray because they think they're too unrighteous to pray. The reality is every last one of you, including myself, we are all too unrighteous to pray. God actually can't accept me on my own merits. He can't. If I went to God on my own, God would say, kick rocks, take a hike. I'm not going to listen to you. He can't because I'm a sinner. Same thing with you. I don't care if you're more righteous than me or less righteous. It doesn't matter. We're all in the sinful category. 
And no one can go to God on our own. But here's the amazing truth of the Bible. This is one of the best pieces of news in all the Bible. God invites sinful people to pray. He invites us to come talk to him. So many of you tonight, maybe you've never prayed. Maybe you've never directed your thoughts to God. Maybe you've never called on God for mercy. Here's the amazing truth. God asks you and invites you to do that. Listen to this. Write some of these verses down. From the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Listen to God speak. He says, come now. Let us reason together. Let's have a conversation, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they're like a bright red stain on a white wedding dress. Though they're like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. And if you read the whole book of Isaiah, the reality is the people keep sinning and they choose not to do this. It's very interesting. The Israelites reject the offer of salvation. And what happens near the middle of the book of Isaiah is God starts directing his attention to the future. And he says, okay, yeah, these people didn't embrace salvation. So I'm going to offer it to the world. I'm not just going to offer it to this small group of people. Now I'm going to point forward and even people in the future can be saved. And God makes that salvation available. We read that actually on the screen tonight. I don't know if you caught that. But Isaiah 53 is what Jesus did to accomplish salvation. As it approaches the end of the book of Isaiah, it's God describing, here's how I'm going to save the world. He says, you can be saved. You can have your sins washed away. Again, when Jesus says, ask and it will be given. Seek and it, you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. If, if I took that concept and you brought it into your thoughts about being saved, a lot of you don't believe those promises even about being saved. Some of us think that oh, if I pray to God and I go to God and my heart's broken, he won't accept me because of something that I've done. He won't accept me because of something that I said in the past. The Bible actually says that's not true. He will accept you. But you have to come to him rightly. You have to come to him, not like the Pharisee, not saying, oh, God, I'm not that bad. I mean, my sin, I have everybody's sins. We're all making mistakes, you know. No, you have to come to God and you have to say, I I'm a sinner and I'm, I'm, it's like the only sinner on the planet. David said in Psalm 51, it's against you and you only that I've sinned. The Bible says that a broken and a contrite heart, God will not despise. He will not push you away. That's Psalm 51, 17. Listen to what else God has to promise for us. This is in the New Testament. Write this down. Uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. 1 John 1, 9. Why don't you write it down? 1 John 1, 9. Here's what it says. Here's a promise from God. If we confess our sins... Confess means agree with God. The word is literally to say the same thing. If we confess our sins, he, that's God, is faithful, so he'll do it. And he's just, that means he's able to do it and stay righteous. To forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Some of us hear the first part, but we never hear the second part of that verse. He's able to forgive us, but we think, oh, well, maybe he forgives us and maybe, you know, he doesn't count anymore, but he's not going to take away sin from my life. And he's not going to cleanse me. He's not going to wipe my slate clean before God. It'll just kind of be in the past. No. He says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That means God can look at you tonight, and though you're a sinner, and though I'm a sinner, he can look at you, and he can say, you're perfectly righteous in my sight because Jesus was perfectly righteous in your place. That's what he promises. Listen to this. Romans chapter 10 verse 13. Very simple. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls on him, and again, we've got to make the caveat, calls on him rightly. It's not as simple as just saying, okay, uh, I call on the name of the Lord Jesus to be saved. Okay? That's not saving faith. You've got to call on him rightly, which means with a broken heart, approaching God, sincerely giving up your sin and repentance, and putting your total faith that Jesus died on the cross for you, you can be saved. But without that, and without prayer, I, this is a big mind-blowing concept, you, it's impossible to be saved. I said this tax collector was a bad guy. He's not the only bad guy in the book of Luke. In fact, Luke strategically puts bad people all throughout the book who get saved to prove the main concept of the book. The main concept of the book comes in Luke 19.10 where it says the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Right? You probably heard that verse before. All throughout the book of Luke, Luke puts in these stories where he says, look at this person who got saved. 
Look at this unrighteous person who got saved. This is just one of them. Luke 18 is in the middle. But even before that, he tells this parable of the prodigal son. Right? You've probably heard this story before. This is a guy who literally goes up to his dad and says, you're dead to me. Sell all your stuff. I want my inheritance right now. So the dad had to sell all of this land. He had to sell all of his assets so that he could give his son his inheritance. It says he took that money and he squandered it on reckless living. It says he squandered it on alcohol. It says he squandered it on prostitutes. I mean, imagine someone, maybe imagine one of your siblings saying to dad or mom, you're dead to me. I want my inheritance right now. And they sold their house. And you guys moved from a house to an apartment so that you could give all that money to your older sibling. And then they took it and, and they were spending it on prostitutes and drugs. The money doesn't last long and it didn't last long for this guy. It says it came to a point where in Luke 15 it says that he was longing to be fed by the pods that the pigs were eating. So he was feeding pigs. He didn't even have enough food to feed himself. He's feeding the pigs better than he was eating. In the middle of that, the prodigal son makes a decision to pray. Listen to what he says. This is Luke 15, 18. He says, I will arise and I will go to my father. And I will say to my father, Father, I've sinned against heaven, that's God, and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. But he wants to come back. He's seeking forgiveness. He's saying, I, whatever your thing that you're going to let me do, I just, I want to be a part of your family again. I don't even need to be a son anymore. Treat me like a servant. I just want to be back with you and I feel terrible. I spent all your money. It's gone. We're never getting it back. But please, just let me come back. He makes this decision. It says in verse 20, then he arose and he came to his father. But while he was a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And he said to his son, or, and the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called my, your son. And he goes on to embrace him as a son again. He says, you're not going to be a servant. He actually doesn't even be able to say, oh, I'll be your servant. Because the father cuts him off and he says, you are going to be my son again. If you feel like you can't come to God, the prodigal son says, no, you, yes, you can come to God. There's a story at the end of the Gospel of Luke, Luke 23, where Jesus is dying on the cross and there's a person next to him who's been a criminal. And actually, the Gospel says at the beginning of the crucifixion, the man on his right and on his left, one of them, or actually both of them at the beginning, were mocking Jesus, both of them. But by the end, maybe it was what Jesus said. Maybe it was the way that Jesus prayed. Maybe it was how he was forgiving the people that were crucifying him. But by the end, one of them comes to Jesus he doesn't go anywhere because he's on the cross. But he actually turns to the other guy who's mocking him. And he says, why are you saying all this stuff about him? We deserve to be put to death. But this guy's done nothing wrong. And then he turns to Jesus and he says a very simple phrase. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me. What is that? What's contained in that little phrase? It's first of all, recognizing that Jesus is king. It's recognizing that Jesus has the power to let him in, so to speak. And a full transfer of trust. And Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. They both died that afternoon. And they both were in heaven after. There's all these stories in the Gospel of Luke about people doing bad things and then people being saved. It's not just in the, in the book of Luke. In fact, there's an interesting story. I want you to write this reference down. Second, uh, Second Chronicles chapter 33. Second Chronicles 33 tells the story of a king named Manasseh. Manasseh was a king in Judah. He was so bad. Um, he was so far removed from being, you know, God's righteous king that he was even burning his own sons in the fire. What they would do is they would, uh, in these Old Testament sacrifices, uh, these foreign gods would require the life of these kids. So, you know, uh, these kings would even have their, their babies, their wives would be pregnant, they'd throw their baby shower, they'd have all this fun stuff, they'd celebrate the birth of their son or their daughter, and then they'd take that baby, and then they'd put that baby on an altar, and they would burn that baby to death. The king of Israel, the king of Judah, Manasseh. Unrighteous, as unrighteous as it gets. Do, doing something worse probably than any of you will ever do. Here's what the text says. This is Second Chronicles 33, 9. It says, Manasseh led Judah... And the inhabitants of Jerusalem astray to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the people of Israel. 
The Lord spoke to Manasseh and to his people, and they paid no attention. So God was offering this guy salvation and speaking to him through the prophets, and they said, I don't want to hear it. Verse 11, therefore, the Lord brought upon them the commanders of the armies of the king of Assyria. So this kingdom comes in, captures Manasseh with hooks. Right? Imagine this, sticking you know, hooks in this guy's hands and hooks through this guy's nose, through the septum of his nose. Maybe hooks through his cheeks and pulling him like a slave to a foreign country. It's pretty humbling. It's pretty humiliating. It says, and while he did that, verse 12, when he was in distress, he entreated the favor of the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. He prayed to him, and God was moved by his entreaty and heard his plea and brought him back to Jerusalem and into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. Some of you might feel like that's kind of where you're at. It's like, man, maybe I'm not a king. Maybe I'm not led in chains somewhere, but my life really sucks, and it feels like God is breaking me, and he's taking things away just like it was to Manasseh. And for some of you, you need to realize that's because God is trying to get your attention to get you to stop sinning. And if there's anybody that God would close his ears to, it's Manasseh, right? Because the text literally says God was trying to get him to, to turn, but he wouldn't. And he refused for a long time. And it wasn't until God crushed him that he finally turned. But you notice what it says? When he prayed, it was when he prayed, God saw his plea. And God was moved by his plea. That's a language of like God saw and cared. He felt for him. And he saved him. Later in the text it says when he came home, he took away all the foreign gods and all the idols of the house of the Lord and the altars that he had built on the mountain of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem. Then he threw them outside the city. So this guy wasn't just asking God for a favor when he was in trouble. There's real repentance that happens. You notice it's the same thing, whether it's the book of Luke, whether it's the book of 2 Chronicles, or whether it's your testimony. Here's what needs to happen for every last one of us. We need to be broken before God. We need to humbly come to God. We need to throw away our sin. Whether you're a king in Judah or whether you're a teenager who's doing things and saying things that your parents don't know about and doing things that you know are wrong against your own body, whether it be sexually, whether it be with your words, whether it be with your friends, it could even be something that's considered mild on the scale of sin. But you gotta throw it away. Psalm 66, 18 says, if I had cherished iniquity in my heart, God would not have answered my prayer. Uh, That's a good lesson for us. Some people tonight, uh, you're going to respond to this, at least in your mind, thinking, well, I tried that. I I tried to repent. I was in seventh grade, and I went to some revival, and, you know, and I was scared of hell, and then I I prayed, and, but then God didn't hear me. He didn't answer. Well, the answer for us, for a lot of us, is right there, Psalm 66, 18. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, if you loved your sin while you were also asking for salvation. He says, God wouldn't listen to you. God's not going to save you, right? And I know that's an odd concept, but think about it. God will not save you, even if you call on him, even if you ask him, if you cherish iniquity in your heart. If you say, yeah, I'm repenting of my sin, but I'm not going to confess all of it. I certainly don't want to tell my smart lady about all of it. I don't want to tell my parents about it because that's called cherishing iniquity in your heart. David says in Psalm 66, if I cherish iniquity in my heart, God would never have answered me. That was Manasseh. The next guy who reigned was his son, Ammon. And Ammon, I'm sure, saw what happened to his father. He probably saw the scars that were in his mouth and in his nose and in his hands because of all what happened, right? He got dragged to Assyria. He knew all that. He probably knew his dad before he repented. He probably knew his dad after. But when he took over, it says he only reigned for two years. And he was 22 years old when he began to reign. Not much older than you. It says, when he began to reign, he reigned for two years in Jerusalem, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. As Manasseh, his father, had done, Ammon sacrificed to the images that Manasseh, his father, had made, and he served them. And he did not humble himself before the Lord, as Manasseh, his father, humbled himself. But this Ammon incurred guilt more and more. He made a decision as a young man to not humble himself before God. And do you notice I said he was 22 years old when he began to reign, and he only reigned for two years? You know what that means? By the time of his 24th birthday, he was done. God said, you're done. Your window of opportunity is over. I'm not, you're not being saved, and his life was taken. Psalm 10, verse 3 says, For the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul, and the greedy 
for gain, curses and renounces the Lord. And in the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. It's a characteristic of wicked people to not seek God. And that's basically, as we focus back on this idea of prayer, I want you to realize if you don't seek God, whether you think you're a Christian or a non-Christian, right? Let's throw both of those out. Let's just say for anybody. If you don't seek God regularly, the Bible says, you understand that that's arrogant? That's proud? There's a lot of pride that goes in. And again, this is true. Maybe if you refuse to come to God and you're hearing me say this and you're like, I don't want to even hear it. I'm going to close my ears. I don't want to hear it, right? That's true for you. But it's also true for you people who profess to be Christians who never seek the Lord. There's arrogance in that. You might not be, you know, in the, in the wicked category who's always seeking to do people harm. But it says, listen to this again. This is Psalm 10, 4. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. Point number two, I'd love for you to write this down. If you never pray, I want you to see this. You're displaying arrogance before God. You're displaying a level of pride and arrogance. Arrogance is even more intense than pride. Pride might be, you know, the character of a person's heart. But arrogance is, I think, even a little deeper than that. Obviously, it's similar. But it's that bold disregard for, for God and his word. And you see it on the screen, so I'd love for you to just turn there. You already see this, but um, turn to Revelation chapter three. Let's look at another text here. Um, hope you have your Bible because we're turning to text. This is how we're gonna do it this weekend. Um, Revelation chapter three, verse 15. This is a section of scripture where Jesus is talking to different churches. He's telling people um, whether they're doing well or whether they're not doing well. And it's cool that these churches actually get to hear directly from Jesus. I wonder what Jesus would say to us if he wrote a letter like this. If he observed True North, if he observed Compass Bible Church, what would he say about us? Well, in these seven churches, we see some pretty clear con- instruction. And here in verse number 15, Revelation three fifteen. hopefully you got it pulled up in your Bible. I want everyone to check this out. Jesus looks at them. This is Jesus who in the first chapter was described as one whose eyes were like flaming fire. That's a poetic description, but what it tells us is it's like God sees right through all of our lies. He sees through all of our hypocrisy. He knows all of it. And the same thing is true. He sees all your humility too. Some of you think that God doesn't see and God doesn't notice your humble heart. And this says, no, no, Jesus sees. Look what he says in verse 15. I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. Would that you be either hot or cold, right? And in that town, there was like this spring of water that made the water hot. And, you know, then there's cold water that's nice. And basically the point is, it's like you're not one or the other. You're kind of in between. And he says, because, verse 16, you're lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit or spit you out of my mouth. I don't believe that Jesus would say that to Christians, which is why I think a lot of people in this church were professing Christians, but not actually saved. Which, I I hope I don't need to remind you this, but do you know what the stats are for how youth groups operate and how many people stay and how many people go? How many people in the church grow up in church and how many people stay? And, And when they're 20 and 25 and 27 and when they're 32, how many of them are still serving the Lord? It's, it's less than half of the people that attend youth groups. It's less than half of the people who go to camps like this. These professing Christians didn't pray. And you might say, how do you know they didn't pray? Look at verse 17. It says, for you say, I'm rich. I've prospered and I need nothing. Interesting. They're saying, I don't need anything from God. I don't need anything from Jesus. I'm fine. I'm good on my own. And do you realize that when we don't pray, that's exactly what we're telling God? I'm rich. I've prospered. I don't need you. You might think that's dramatic, but look what he says next. He says, not realizing that you're wretched and pitiable and poor and blind and naked. These people were deceived, right? Just like a lot of us think that we're strong. And some of you people think that you're strong and robust Christians because of all that you know. But God sees right through a lot of that and says, look, there could be at the bottom of that, if you don't pray, if you don't seek the Lord, if you don't actually know God, at the bottom of it, it's wretched, pitiable, poor, poor, blind and naked. That's what God calls these people, these professing Christians. 
Verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by the fire so that you may be rich. You say you're rich, but you're not rich. Right? This is talking spiritually, of course. What you really need is to come to me because I could give you what you think you have. Some people in this room say, I don't, I don't need to pray because I'm already at peace. Jesus says, no, if you don't seek it through me, you're wretched and pitiable and poor and blind. And honestly, if you're by yourself and you're you know, in your anxious closet, you'll actually realize that. And maybe put on a nice face when you're with everybody else, but uh, that's not the truth. He says, you can get from me what you think you have on your own. He says, and white garments. I can give you white garments, pure garments, so that you could clothe yourself. And the shame of your nakedness might not, might not be seen. Right? That's that picture of like purity and impurity, right? Like your sin could be dealt with. Jesus says, you think that you have no sin. The reality is you have so much sin. It's like you don't even have anything to clothe yourself. You're so impure. I could give you forgiveness. I could give you a covering. I could give you perfect righteousness. But you have to ask. He says, I can give you salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Right? He called them blind. And now he's saying, you know, you're, you're blind to your sin, but I could give you what you need so that you wouldn't be blind anymore. I could give it all to you, but you have to ask. And that was the problem. These people didn't think they needed, so they didn't ask. And really, that's what makes lukewarm Christians. You understand what makes lukewarm Christians? When they don't pray. That's what happens. You want to know why? Sin isn't being dealt with in your life. You want to know why? You feel like you don't have the joy of the Lord. You want to know why it's not happening? Really, at the bottom of almost all of it, and I know it's a weird thought, but I do want you to think it through tonight. At the bottom of almost all of that is, look, if you would have just prayed and been constant, if you would have sought the Lord, we wouldn't even be in this situation. Same thing for these people. Verse 19. This is the hard part in interpreting this passage, actually. If you ever studied this, it's like, are they saved or are they not saved? Well, verse 19 says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So he says, I'm trying to call you out of it. And tonight's sermon might feel a little bit like that. It might feel a little hard. It might feel a little harsh. But, but I want you to hear God speaking through this text to you. And he says this, those whom I love, I reprove. The characterization of people who God doesn't love. If you ever thought that through, that there are people that God doesn't love. The scripture does talk about that. He doesn't call them out of their sin. He lets them stay in their sin. He lets them stay blind. But those who feel the conviction of God's spirit, and I pray and I've been praying that you would feel the conviction of God's spirit even as I speak right now, that's a sign that God loves you and he's calling you to himself. He says, so be zealous and repent. Zealous means passionate. Zealous means fired up. Like, I'm, I'm going to be completely different. And repent means to change, right? It means to not be the same way. So here's what Jesus says to us tonight. Um, if we think that we've got it all, like the Pharisee, if we think like this church, we don't need anything from God, the reality is we do. If we don't pray to God, that's a big problem. And even if we're professing Christians and we never pray and we never seek the Lord, that's a big problem. That's arrogance before God. But he says, those whom I love, I reprove. So be zealous and repent. If you're a Christian, who is saved, who has been neglecting God, who hasn't been going to God, right? And I feel this conviction too. Studying this is like the most convicting thing for me. It's like, I need to be seeking God better and in the day-to-day, -day, in the normal life, not just when you're preparing to preach on, you know, prayer, not when you're preparing for camp, but all the time. If you're a Christian, you still, you need to be zealous and repent. But going back to that first point, many of you need to be zealous and repent for the first time. Really repent for the first time. I mean, how many testimonies, if you go to our church and you listen to the baptism tank, like how many testimonies do you hear from people who said, I thought I was saved, but then I realized I wasn't saved. Like that happens all the time, right? And a lot of people, you know, they're like, don't, you know, don't, don't listen to those people tell you, you know, maybe you're not saved. And, and again, I, I understand what they're saying, but the point I'm trying to make is you've heard that enough times to know that that's possible to be deceived, right? Um, I mean, I've been deceived. There was a time in my life I thought I was saved, right? And what I really tried to do was I tried to repent and change the, the couple things. If someone said, hey, what do you need to repent of? I could list the three or four things and they said, okay, here's the plan. I'm just gonna like, try to fix it and I'm gonna make it better and I'm just gonna like adjust a couple things and then I've got it. Saying it like that shows that, well, I was never trusting in Jesus. It wasn't until I trusted in Jesus completely and said, you need to take my sin. 
I need your help. Not just your help. I need you to save me. I can't do it. I realized that what I was trying to do before was just, uh, and I've used this analogy before, I was just trying to like staple fruit of the spirit onto my tree, so to speak. Like I was just trying to staple them on. They weren't real though. I was, I was, ended up being fake. Those whom I love, I reprove, be zealous and repent. Look at verse number 20, a verse that gets misconstrued a lot, but it's an interesting one for us to see. This is on the bottom of some of your in and out burger cups. Look what it says. It says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. He's saying, hey, this church it's like I'm on the outside of the church. You guys are doing your thing in church, this Laodicean church, but Jesus is on the outside. He got left to the side. He says, if anyone wants to let me in, I might not have dinner with that person and that person, but I'll let you be my person. And he's saying, this church could be an evil church, right? And, and thank God that you don't go to an evil church, right? Like a lot of people uh, do, like these Laodiceans. But he says, even if you are amongst bad people, if you open the door of the church, right? If you're willing to embrace Christ, just like the first point, God offers salvation. This arrogance uh, is something that I want you to think through. And I, those of you, especially who, who profess to be Christians and think, okay, well, I, I have prayed and I remember when I asked God for salvation. I even remember knowing and being assured, okay, he took care of my sin. He forgave me, right? A lot of you can think back to that time, right? I can think back to that time for myself. Well, here's a couple principles that we need to keep in mind, okay? James 1.17 is a good passage to write down. James 1.17 says, every good and perfect gift comes from God. So every good gift, everything that you enjoy, every provision, every time of laughter, every time of enjoyment with friends, all of that comes from God. And it's like he's constantly dispensing, constantly giving good Imagine if your parents gave you money like God was good to you. Um, you'd be really rich. You know, sometimes you gotta ask your parents for money and there's that like, are you sure? Like, I already gave you 40 bucks for that thing before. Like, do you have any change from that? And there's that negotiation, right? That's because your parents' funds are limited, right? Well, most of them. Uh, maybe your parents' funds are unlimited, but you know, they're still limited, right? You can't ask for a Bugatti and you know, get that, probably not, right? So they're limited to some extent. Here's the thing. God is like this unlimited rich father who's constantly dispensing gifts. But the problem is, what happens to people who get a lot of good gifts and never say thank you? They become spoiled, rotten brats, right? You ever babysitted a spoiled, rotten brat? You ladies, you ever babysitted one? Or then you maybe some of you work in kids' men, and it's like, oh, that one's like, <sighs> that one's bad. Hopefully Eden's not one of those. Uh, it always scares me to say that now that I have a kid. I'm like, oh man, I hope my daughter's not spoiled rotten. But anyway, point is, uh, you've been around those kids, or maybe you've seen. Have you ever seen that trend on? Uh, it was an Instagram trend. It was like Russian billionaires' kids. Did you see that? It was like a year or two ago that they were posting like all the private planes that they were on, all the like super expensive stuff. And they were just posting, posting, posting. And it became like this battle where all these rich kids from like Russia, and they're all like, their, their daddies are like, you know, oil tycoons or whatever. And then all these like Arab families are like going at it. These people that live in Dubai and you know, no Americans, by the way, <laughs> we're, we're part of that. Um, I guess you can't be rich enough here to, to be a part of that. But anyway, uh, it was like they were going after it, right? They're spoiled, right? You can look at people who have more than you and think, man, they're spoiled. And you know what? The more spoiled they are, the more they have, the more ungrateful they become. Here's a question for you, Christian. Is that true of you? So many gifts, so many lavish gifts that God gives. Do we ever say thank you? Or, or do we just say thank you when the big gift is given? What about the small things? What about the laughter? What about the friendships? What about the snow? What about a good meal? What about water? What about, I mean, it sounds like ridiculous, but like go, go some time without it. Right? And that's why, by the way, connected to prayer is often this idea of fasting. Right? We're not going to get into that very much this weekend, but one of the reasons it's connected in the Bible and how Jesus expects us not just to pray, but he also expects us to fast is because fasting is like a, it's an example of I'm letting those good gifts be taken away so that I can be even more thankful for them when I get them back. So I can focus on God in prayer and seek God like I'm thirsty, like I'm hungry. It's just interesting that God's gifts are constantly dispensed to us, but we often don't even think about it. Psalm 24, 1 says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and the world and those who dwell therein. Everything, everyone belongs to God. 
God has given you so much. He's given me so much. We think about God's gifts like they belong to us. We start to think wrongly. For example, uh, some of you maybe had to borrow some clothes this weekend. Right? Maybe you didn't have any snow jackets or snow pants or those of you who go on snowboard and skiing, maybe you borrowed some stuff or you borrowed some boots. And many of you tomorrow are going to go to the rental shop and you're going to borrow other people's stuff. It doesn't belong to you. You're going to borrow it. Right? And they're going to let you. And again, obviously, with the people at the rentals, it's all, you paid for it. So it's not like they're just you know, being nice guys to let you borrow their helmets or whatever. You paid for it all. But it's not yours. Right? It doesn't belong to you. When we think of our life and our gifts from God, you, that's a helpful way to think about it. Your body, it's not yours. The Bible says that clearly. It's God's. He's letting you use it. Your family, your relationships, it's God on loan to you, which is why Job can say when his kids all die, when 10 kids die in one day, and when his wife turns on him, and when he loses all of investments, and he loses all of his house, you know what he says? The Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Didn't belong to me anyway. Wasn't even mine. So thankful God let me have it for the time I had it. So thank- I mean, imagine you're mourning, you got 10 kids who died. Right? Oh, so thankful that I got to see them grow up. So thankful that I got to see them laugh. And so thankful I got to hold their hand as they were taking their first steps. And they're all dead now. But God gave and God t- and he takes away. And it's God's prerogative to do so. If we start to think of God's gifts to us like that, it changes the way we pray. The inverse of that is this arrogance. Isaiah 55, God offers, and I've been quoting Isaiah a lot, and I love the book of Isaiah because it has this whole theme to it. God offers salvation at the beginning. And then there's all this description of sin. And then he goes on and God offers more salvation. And God says, I'm going to judge the nations, but I'm going to give these people salvation. And at the end of that book, looking forward to nights like this, And looking forward to after we receive Christ, he says, come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. He who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. And then he tells these people, why do you spend your money on things that are not bread and you labor for things that don't satisfy? He's saying, why do you give your whole life chasing this pursuit and this life of sin when it will never make you happy? Come to me. I'm the fountain of living water. Jesus even uses that analogy. He says, listen to me diligently. and Eat what's good. Delight yourself in the rich food that I provide. He goes on to describe what he's talking about. That's like a big analogy, right? He's talking about food and, you know, milk and wine. Like, what's all that about? What he's saying is, in verse 6, this is Isaiah 55, 6. Listen to this. God says, seek the Lord when he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man his thoughts. Give up your sin. Get rid of it. And let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon Even if you think your sin is too big or too strong or too ingrained in you to be forgiven or to be cleansed from, he says, no, I can do it. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. I love how he goes into this. He says, look, my thoughts, the things I think, the things I can do, they're bigger than what you can imagine. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. What is he saying? He's talking to people who don't believe that they can be forgiven. And he says, you don't understand how big my forgiveness is. We can put that in the context of Jesus and say, you don't understand how expansive and how much grace is contained in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus the Lord. You have no idea. So he says, come. And you might say, all this talk, all this, you know, it's talking about arrogance and you know, not being saved, all from just not praying? That's a little bit worse than not flossing, right? This is a bigger deal than that. Yes, all of it from not praying. There's a text in the New Testament that talks to Christians who are not praying the way they need to. And it's the last text I'm going to turn you to. So um, turn to James chapter 4. Turn to the left in your Bibles real quick. If you're in Revelation 3, turn to James 4. We're going to end on this one tonight. But I want you to see, you could be a Christian who's in a right relationship with God. And this sermon, I don't know if you're noticing it, but it's taking it. It's in its like we're focusing further and further down. We started with if you never pray, then you can't be saved then maybe you have prayed at the beginning, but you don't pray now and that shows an arrogance. And it goes even further to say, okay, this is gonna talk to Christians now. 
in, in point number three in this text. It's going to talk to the people who are legitimately saved, who've called on the name of the Lord, who've been saved, but maybe even you don't pray the way that you need to. James 4, 1 says, what causes quarrels? That's a fight. That's an argument. That's gossip. That's slander in a church. He says, what causes fights among you, Christians? Is it not this? That your passions, your desires, your lusts are at war within you. Okay. Uh, that's why you fight. You ever realize, like, think about any fight you've ever had with anybody. Literally, think about it. What was going on? You had desires, you had passions, and you thought, I want my way to be the way that this goes. And they had other passions, and they had other desires, and they wanted things to go a certain way. And when those two things were not in perfect alignment, there was fighting. There was quarreling. There was gossip. He says in verse 2, you desire... You want, and you don't have, so you murder, right? That's the most extreme case, right? You know, if I wanted your beanie, and I just had to have it, and I just couldn't take no for an answer, and I couldn't steal it, and you wouldn't let me have I guess I just have to kill you, right? That's what murder is about, right? This is the most extreme case. There's a lot of cases that are less extreme than that, right? You fight, you steal, there's a lot of things less than that. But the ultimate thing is, if you really want something, and you never get it, and you want it so bad, and you can't have it, you murder. This is a little less severe. You covet, which means you look at something that someone else has, and you want it, and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel, right? This is just common sense. The root of fighting in your household, by the way, think this one through. The reason your parents fight, the reason you fight with your parents is because there's a lot of unmet desires. You have desires that are unmet, you think things aren't fair. You think things aren't the way they need to be, right? And maybe even you think of your parents and how they might fight. The, the reality is it's because they have desires that are unmet, right? Your dad is disappointed with your mom. Your mom is disappointed with your dad. Your dad is upset at your mom. Your, your mom is upset at your dad. Why? Because they're fighting. Why are they fighting? Well, because they have unmet desires. Same thing with you. Every time you fight, it's because of unmet desires. And you might be saying, what does this have to do with prayer? Look at the next thing. He says, you do not have... Because you do not ask. He's saying your desires are not met because you never pray. Isn't that interesting that in the middle of fighting, he says the problem is, ultimately, you don't even pray. You never go to God. You never stop and pray. It's just interesting. He tells these Christians you're not asking. But then look at verse number three. He says sometimes you do pray. And you ask and you don't receive what you ask for because you ask wrongly. Which goes back to that first point. There's a way to call on God in a way that harbors sin, and God's not going to answer that prayer. So he even says here, there's a way to ask wrongly. You ask wrongly to spend it on your passions, right? to have God answer your prayers so that you can be right, so that all your desires can be fulfilled. It's just interesting that even in this text, he's talking to Christians. He's talking to people who, who should be loving each other, who should be you know, singing together at church. He's talking to people who should be holding each other accountable in small groups. And he says to them, why are we fighting? And he says, because you, you don't pray. Or if you do pray, you pray wrongly. Point number three, if you never pray, you should expect your life to be a war zone. You should expect your life to be a full-on war zone. In your heart, in your life, in your family, in your small groups. And I know this is a big claim, and I feel like i got a lot of proving to do tonight. But I think the scriptures will back this up. If you do not pray, you should expect your life to be a war zone. You should expect never to overcome sin. You should expect that there's constant friction and problems. Because you don't pray, if you don't pray. I found a lot of verses on this, so I have 10 things. So mark down 1 through 10 real quick. I want you to write these quick things down, 10 things. There's probably more, but the 10 things that I could find in Scripture, things we either miss out on or things that we don't get to have if we never pray, or as Christians, if we don't pray regularly, what will we miss out on? If you ever ask a teenager, what's the biggest problem facing teenagers today? What's the biggest problem facing teenagers today? Almost unanimously, what they will say is some form of anxiety or some form of insecurity or some lack of peace. Um, and they can blame it on your phone or on social media, or whatever you can blame it on, right? Ultimately, um, those things don't make it easier, but it comes back to the human heart. But the Bible says, if we don't pray, we should expect a lot of anxiety in our heart. Here's the first thing. Uh, you should expect to be anxious, depressed, and scared. 
Here's a verse for you. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. Listen to this. God's word says if you don't pray, you should expect a lot of anxiety in your life. Right? And I'm going to give you these things because I do want you to think backwards. And I want you to think, man, is my life full of a lot of these things? And then I want you to trace it back and say, maybe it's because I'm not praying about them. Listen to this. This is 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7. It says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time, he may exalt you. That sounds like point number one, right? That sounds like saying, I'm going to follow you no matter what, God. Listen to what he says next. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And the reason some people in this room are constantly anxious, constantly worried, is because there's something they're not doing that they should be doing. It's very interesting. There's something that they're not doing that they should be doing. What's the thing they should be doing that they're not doing? Casting their anxieties on the Lord. You know, that's just a euphemism for prayer. It's taking my anxieties. Let's say I'm anxious about something at school. Let's say I'm anxious about something that's going on. And I take those anxieties and then I put them off of my shoulders, so to speak, and I give them to God and God can carry them. Some of you are carrying your anxieties all the time and you're unwilling or there's some reason you don't want to give them to God. Right? That could be a lot of different reasons like we talked about in the first couple points. But the reality is it's because we don't pray. Anxiety, depression, being just scared. That's the first thing. Second thing comes from Philippians 4, 4 to 7. You will miss out on and you cannot have the joy and the peace that Christ offers if you never pray. Even as a Christian, you cannot have the joy and the peace that God can provide for Christians if you don't pray. You will just miss out on it. A lot of Christians go through life scared and they go through life bitter because they don't pray. Listen to this. This is Philippians 4, 4. Paul tells them, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. <laughs> 10 verses later, he's gonna say, yeah, sometimes I went without food. Sometimes I, I didn't have what I need, but you know what? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Whether I have a lot or little, I can serve God. And whatever portion he gives me, I can serve him. Next verse, he says, do not be anxious about anything. This is verse six. But in everything by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Prayer means just talking to God. Supplications mean asking things from God. And thanksgiving is pretty obvious. means thanking God for things. Right? Talking to God, communing with God, spending time with him, asking him specifically for things. We're gonna talk about that mostly tomorrow. Okay? And thanking God for things. That's how anxiety goes away. And you might say, oh, no, no, you don't understand my situation. All right, well, well, take it up with the Bible. Right? Take it up with God. Um, this is what he says. And you don't believe that? Listen to the next verse. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, just like Isaiah 55, 8, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. If you don't believe God's word, well, then, you know, I guess you don't believe God's word. You take it by faith. You trust in him. You give your anxieties to God. You're going to see what happens. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. There'll be like a wall of protection. There'll be like a shield that blocks arrows shot at your heart, anxious thoughts. Christ will do that. But it won't happen if you don't pray. That's what we're getting at today. Third thing. Uh, 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 5, is this big section where God wants us to pray. And he says, I want everyone, every church that's gathered, whether you know there's a lot of people or little people, I want men to get up and I want them to pray. I don't want them to be fighting. I don't want them to be quarreling. I want them to lift holy hands and pray. And he starts off by saying this. This is 1 Timothy 2.15. First of all, then, I urge supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. All right, so it's Christians saying, don't just pray for Christians. Pray for all kinds of people. Pray for non-Christians. Pray for your neighbor. Pray for the person at school. Pray for all these different kinds of people. He describes some more. He says, even for kings and for officials and people who are in high places, that we, Christians, may live a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it's pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who, listen to this, desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. He says, I want you to pray for all different types of people. Pray for people that you don't, get, that you don't think will get saved. Pray for people that you think are really close. Pray for your, your teachers. Pray for all of them, because all these different groups, God wants to pull people from every tongue, tribe, and nation, and he's gonna do that. Here's the third thing that we miss out on. If we don't pray, chances are the people that are in your life that God may save through your witness, 
you're not going to lead people to salvation. Right? That's, a, that's a big thing. You're not going to be able to lead people to salvation. I know that's an odd thought. You think, well, well, isn't God sovereign? Well, God is sovereign, and God will sovereignly choose to not use you. And that's the thing you can miss out on. That's sad. There's a famous preacher, Charles Spurgeon, you've probably heard of him. He has a famous line. I don't know, you know where it came from, but I, I always know it, it refers to him. Right? You, you're going to have some of your friends and family that are going to go to hell. That's true for every last one of us. Um, and he says, you know, you don't want them to get there and wonder why you didn't tell them to not be there. You don't want them to get there and, and, and be punished by God and think, why didn't the Christian in my life say something about it? First Timothy 2, 1 through 5 says, God wants to save and God wants you to pray for people to be saved. The fourth thing, very similar to that, um, Colossians 4, 2 to 4, God says you're going to miss out on the open doors that he has for you. You're going to miss out on opportunities to evangelize if you don't pray. That's huge. Colossians 4, 2 to 4 says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. And at the same time, pray also for us, pray for Paul, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I'm in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I should always speak. So, so I want to be careful and I want to have opportunities for open doors for the gospel. But here's the thing. If you don't pray for those, you will not find those. There are people at your school that need to hear the gospel this semester. They need to hear the gospel this semester. I'm thinking especially of you seniors, right? This is your last semester. And many of you juniors, maybe it's your last semester at your school. Or it's the last time someone's going to be open to the gospel and they need to hear it now. There's not really any time to wait. You need to share the gospel with them this semester. It needs to happen. If you don't pray, if you take this sermon, you think, okay, I'm going to put it in the back burner. Oh, I was convicting, but I don't want to listen to it. You realize that you're going to miss all these opportunities to share the truth. You're, you're not going to be looking for opportunities. You're going to let opportunities go by you. You'll miss out on that. Fifth thing that happens if we don't pray. Fifth thing that we should expect is that you'll be spiritually attacked and you'll likely fall into grave sin. If you're not praying, you are setting yourself up to fall in a major way, into major sin. You wonder why people fall into sin. You've seen, you know, pastors fall into sin. And you've seen people who are righteous fall into sin. It's like, man, how did that person who could say all those good things about God, how could they fall into sin? For the most part, it starts right here by not praying. Here's a verse for you. Um, two verses, actually. Matthew 26, 41. Jesus says, and this is in the garden to the disciples. He says, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We might want to do good. We might want to do good things, but you don't understand how powerful sin is if you think, oh, I don't need to pray about it. Another verse for you, maybe even more important. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9 here for number 5. It says, be sober-minded, be watchful because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Um, maybe you haven't put yourself in the shoes of Satan lately, so let's do that right now. Um, what, which people do you think Satan is going to go after? What are the easy targets in this room? Which, which targets are the easy ones that Satan can easily make people fall into sin? Oh yeah, easily make people fall into porn addiction. Easily make people fall into sexual immorality. Oh, that person's easy. They're going to cuss like crazy. It's so easy. Who is easy to take down in this room? The answer is people who are not watchful and not praying. It's that simple. You want to draw a big red target on your spiritual back? Well, then stop praying. And that's what this text is getting at. He says, be watchful, be sober-minded. Your adversary, he prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He says, resist him, firm in your faith. You know, it's really hard to resist temptation when you're not prayerful. It's super hard to do that. Just knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood all throughout the world. There's Christians all over who are being attacked spiritually, who are going to be tempted to sin, who are going to go through these hard experiences that's going to make them want to sin. Similar things like Job, right? Remember, Job was attacked, and God let Job be attacked by Satan. You're not the first, right? You're going to experience spiritual temptation, and you're going to feel like, man, I feel like I'm being attacked, right? Well, you probably are, right? You probably are being attacked. 
Satan's attacking Christians all over the place, but are you going to make yourself an easy target by not praying? Sixth thing. This might be more encouraging, but, it, well, actually, I guess it's all kind of discouraging. Things you miss out on if you don't pray. You're going to miss out on being satisfied in God. You're going to miss out on being satisfied. And you could even take out that last phrase from God. You're just going to be not satisfied at all because you can't be satisfied in the world. You're going to try that if you want to go down that route, but it's not going to make you happy. But you're going to be like, something's missing. Something's missing. Why am I anxious? Why am I scared? Why do I always feel like I'm missing something? Well, if you don't pray, that's exactly what's going to happen, right? And again, some of us, when I say things like that, might, you might catch on to some of those phrases and think, I have thought that before. I have wondered about that. Well, the question I want to bring to you is, well, are we praying? Are we praying like this? Are we praying like Jesus asked us? Verses for you. Psalm 16, 4. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Like the sadness in a person's life when they seek something, a different God, when they seek the God of fame or the God of money or the God of sex, you pursue those things and that's my God, that's what I'm chasing, that's what I'm chasing. Their sorrows, their sadness will multiply. Right? Multiplying adds up faster than addition, right? <laughs> multiplying it over and over again. Big, big consequences. Later in that Psalm, David writes, Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life. And in your presence, there's fullness of joy. And at your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Right? Again, I said this at the beginning. A lot of people, when I read that, you make known to me the path of life. And in your presence, there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. I want to ask you if you actually believe that's true. Is it actually true to that reject your sin and to say, I'm not going to live like the world, that you are going to experience more, get this word, kind of feels like a weird Bible word, pleasure? Pleasure. <laughs> that's usually not a word you identify with godly things, right? Godly things are hard and stern and, you know, you've got to work for it. And, you know, pleasure. This text says there is more pleasure at God's right hand, at his side, being with him than you could ever experience by chasing any sinful thing. You don't believe it, right? If, if you don't believe it, I'm just telling you, it's what God's word is so clear about. Listen to this, a guy who was satisfied in God. This is Psalm 34, 4. David says, I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, like their faces are shining, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, he's talking about himself, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them, right? You want God to relieve you of your burden, of your anxiety, you want him to do that? Well, then fear the Lord, seek him, go to God. This is what the scriptures promise. And then listen to this, verse eight. Oh, taste and see. The author says, hey, everybody, listen up. Hey, hey, you could experience the goodness of God too. You could know it too. He says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. He's saying, guys, go to God. You think, you think that chasing sin is gonna make you happy? Stop, go to God. You're never gonna have this perspective if you don't pray. Psalm 63, similar idea. It says, oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. You'll never say that if you don't pray. You'll never think that if you don't pray. He says, so I've looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and your glory because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. You'll never say God's steadfast love is better than life if you never pray. And he says, my soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. He doesn't have food. He's thirsty. But he says, it's like I just ate a big meal. It's like I had a steak and I had the fat on the side of the T-bone. It's all great. And it's, I'm, I'm full. I've got mashed potatoes. I've got corn. I've got, you know, chocolate souffle at the end. Yeah, I'm full. Not actually, not physically, but I'm full. I wasn't satisfied. Now I am satisfied. Where did that happen? Praying. The sixth thing is like, you just won't be satisfied if you don't look to God. Seven. Something else you'll miss out on. You'll miss out on forgiveness. You'll miss out on closeness to God. You'll miss out on walking through life with a clean conscience is what I'm getting at. Psalm 32 writes all about this. Psalm 32 talks about um, it's a blessed thing, which blessed means happy. 
So blessed, blessed is the man means you will be so happy of a person if this was true of you. It says blessed is the man, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no sin and in whose spirit there's no deceit. Right? You know how good it is to be honest? You know how good it is to sit in a small group and be honest and not hide your sin? Like so many of us hide our sin. That's why so many of us hate small group time, right? Because you're, you're lying. You're being dishonest and you're putting up a fake face and a fake front. He says, you know how good it is to just not have deceit in your spirit, have a clear conscience? And he says, when I kept silent, this is Psalm 32, 3, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away. When I didn't pray, when I didn't confess my sin, it's like my body started hurting. Right? Is this saying that there is a psychosomatic, if you know that word, there's a psychosomatic effect on not confessing your sin that maybe your body will act different? It's exactly what the Bible says. It's exactly what the Bible says. Again, go backwards. I know that's a scary thought, right? But he says, my bones wasted away. My, my, my whole self, I wasn't feeling right. I felt sick to my stomach, right? You ask a person who's under conviction of sin, did you ever feel sick to your stomach? physically when you were convicted over your sin, almost everyone's just like, yeah, I felt sick. I felt like I could throw up. Right? This says when I kept sinning, my bones wasted away. My flesh was like, felt like it was getting burned off of me. It was weird. My groaning all day long, my bones wasted away. For night and day, your hand was heavy upon me. It was God's good hand of discipline. He's trying to guide and direct us to him away from sin. He says, my strength is dried up as by the heat of summer. Then I acknowledge my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. I brought it to the light and I say, I will confess my sin to the Lord. And then you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, so he transitions. He's talking about himself. Now he's gonna talk to you. He says, therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time that you may be found. The Bible actually says that some people will pray when it's too late. Some people will pray once they face the wrath of God and they're going to pray, and it will be too late. And here's the good news. It's not too late for anyone right here. It's not too late. It says, if you're godly, offer prayer while he may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. Our judgment's going to come like a flood one day, but God can protect us. And then he says to God, you are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. The seventh thing was, you're going to miss out on forgiveness and that closeness with God. The eighth thing might sound really simple, but there's a verse about it. The eighth thing is you just will not enjoy God's good gifts that he gives to you to the full extent. You will not enjoy them as much as you would otherwise. And this is an odd thought. You may never have heard this verse before, but 1 Timothy 4, verse 4. Listen to this. 1 Timothy 4, 4. This is Paul writing to Timothy about like these false teachers who were saying, hey, you should you know, abstain from all these foods and all these you know, things. You should never get married, all this stuff. Paul says, okay, stop. None of that's true. He says this, for everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. It's an odd thought. But the ordinary things, like taking a walk outside, like the ordinary things, like the, the penne pasta and the meatballs that you had tonight, right? The good things that you could have and a non-Christian could have, and it could be the same calories and it could be the same exact things. But what it says is, you know, when we receive it with joy, we receive it with prayer, we receive it even understanding the word of God, do you understand that we embrace God's gifts in a way that's better? Like we can be even more thankful. We enjoy them rightly where the world never really enjoys them rightly because they never acknowledge God as the one who gave it. But you can if you're praying. You're going to miss out on that good, simple little gift if you don't pray. Ninth, you're going to miss out on resolving relationship conflicts with other Christians. You're going to miss out on that. If you don't pray, you'll probably have a long list of people that you don't get along with anymore. And there's a long list of people that may be sitting in small groups or in the church that don't get along with you anymore. Why? Because we don't pray. Think, how does that have to do with prayer? Listen to this, James 5.16. James 5.16 says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. You know, one of the things that builds unity more than anything else, you confessing your sin to one another. And not simply that. 
Some of you think that if you confess your sin to a a Christian, it'll actually break unity because they'll take that sin and then they'll broadcast it to others and they'll gossip. And that's why I never confess my sin. That's the real fear. And ultimately, if you're going to do that with other people's sin, then that's going to wreck relationships. But this says, if we confess our sins to one another and then pray for one another, it says you'll be healed. That's the solution to our problems here, relationship problems. Then it says this, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. That's an interesting thought. That even our closeness to God and the forgiveness we can have is increased just by someone praying for us. Lastly, very similar to that, um, you're gonna miss out on church unity if you don't pray. If you don't pray with other Christians, now I'm not just talking about individually, now I'm saying praying with other Christians, you're gonna miss out on great unity that you could have with others. Acts 2.42, write it down. Acts 2.42. It says they devoted themselves, these early Christians, first you know, couple weeks of the church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayer. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. This was an impressive time. And all who believed were together and they had all things in common. Where did it start? It started to them being in God's word. It started with them eating together. It started with them spending time together and they were praying together. If you never pray with other Christians, you're impoverishing yourself. You're like, you're you're missing out on such a good gift that God has for you. Talk talk to people, uh, talk to your friends at school. Like, what do you feel like you're missing in life? Almost all of them will say deep, meaningful relationships. I feel like I, I have some friends and it's so shallow and we don't know anything about each other and you know, most of my friends are online or whatever. Do you understand that God's word has this amazing, amazing gift for you as the church? But you gotta pray together. You're gonna miss out on that if you don't pray. That's 10 things. You could probably find 10 more in the scriptures, but that's enough for tonight. Uh, not praying is worse than not flossing. Okay, I said that to you before. But I want you to feel that tonight. We're gonna talk about that in small groups I want this sermon to have a real impact. I want you to remember this sermon in a year. I want you to remember it in five years. And I want this to be a turning point for some of us who never pray. You can pray for the first time. If you did pray at one point and you haven't been praying recently, I want you to go back to God, confess that arrogance, and then seek him. Don't miss out on all the good gifts that God has for us. Let me pray right now. Let's seek God, seek his help through what's called the supplication when we ask God for things that falls under the biblical category of supplication. There's also another word there, intercession, which means that we pray on behalf of other people. So I'm gonna do those two things. I'm gonna supplicate or ask. I'm also gonna intercede, which means I'm gonna pray for you. So let's do those two things right now. God, we ask and we trust that you want to answer our prayers. We believe that you're able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to you. We trust that you can forgive people uh, who've done wrong. We trust that you can forgive us. We don't want to miss out on your forgiveness. We don't want to miss out on your goodness. As we talked about, so many good gifts that you have for us, but please help us not miss out on them. We trust your goodness. We trust you that when we pray that you're not gonna despise us, that you're not gonna turn us away. We know that you will never turn away a person who's truly brokenhearted. So I pray that you would, through this sermon, have our hearts be properly broken so that we would look to you. We don't want to be sad for the purpose of being emo or sad. We want to be sad only to look to you and to be forgiven. So we pray that you would answer our prayers tonight as we recommit to talk to you more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.